the tutorial was uh, quite useful, I guess, for most of you. I was quite happy to see that many got to understand how to use these correlations by the end. Still a few questions from that, and that's what today's class is about. We'll go through a few examples, and then by the end of this class we start to see also how we can upgrade the price of the equipment to account for higher temperatures and pressures and materials. So let's just back up a little bit though and put the put today's class in context with the tutorial from yesterday. As you noticed yesterday, many had questions on the bare module factor and what it means. Uh, my approach always, as, you, as you'll see in my courses, is not just to blindly use equations, but let's actually understand what those equations are doing for us. So when we're multiplying one thing by another and getting a result, that's okay and you're all capable of doing it, but so is a computer. Okay? So if you're going to allow yourself to be replaced by a computer because you're not thinking about the technical work you're actually working on, you're going to be um, shortchanging yourself from your career perspective. So when we work with equations and numbers, let's actually think and interpret what's going on there. So when we were looking at yesterday's very logical factor, there were these numbers of 3.14, 4.0, and essentially what they do is they tell us the relationship between the cost of the equipment as on the pallet, waiting for us to pick up from the supplier, and we can multiply it by that bare module factor, three or four or a number like that, and get the cost of that equipment all installed. So here's this formula that the land factor we saw was take this delivered cost of equipment, multiply it by a factor that ranges between four and five, and we get our fixed capital cost. And that's starting to make sense, or should make sense to you now, when in the context of the bare module. So take the price of the equipment, multiply it by this number, and we get the cost of it all installed at our site. So these values between four and five make sense in the context of what we've seen in the, in the tutorial yesterday. So that uh, should help put that into perspective. After that, we went on a fairly lengthy discussion. Uh, we will recall these two slides where we looked at the things that go into taking a unit that's being delivered to the cost of the whole plant with all the structural detail, the foundations, the piping, the painting, the walkways, the electrical, the piping, pressure gauges, temperature gauges, instrumentation, safety equipment, safety reviews. All of that is the reason why our prices end up tripling, quadrupling, and sometimes being five times the original quoted price you get from the company. Okay, so this is actually surprising for people because when you're in a company, often people, they, they, they're stickler as the detail on the price of the equipment from the supplier. But you're, you're dealing with the wrong issue, right? That price is one fifth or one quarter of what the cost is actually going to be at the end. Okay, so so we, we spent a bit of time last week talking about what goes into that quadrupling of the price, or that tripling of the price in some cases. And then we want to come up with a way so that we can systematically take these quoted prices and upgrade them so that we get a fair estimate here at the end what we call the total market cost. So what we do is we go to historical databases and we look up these costs for equipment at ambient conditions and materials of construction that are pretty standard. Then we upgrade the price, and we get what's called the FOB cost. And then we add more to that. We can then end up with a bare module cost. If we get to that point from step two to step three by adding in all the materials for uh, installation, shipping, all the cost of installing the equipment at our site. Okay. And then well, we haven't done this step three to four yet. Um, and then what that involves is adding in a few other contingencies and, and a few other minor fees to then get the total cost. But this is a small, small increment. The biggest increment comes from step two to three. Taking that cost of the equipment that's available at the vendor's location, bringing it to our site, getting it installed, and, and the rest of that. So let's take a look at, at that again. Um, we had this diagram which is very very informative and shows this description, this pallet of the equipment's on the pallet, and then all the costs, the multiplier from taking it from here to there is what that 
their module factory. So what we'll do is, in today's class, we'll, we'll use some small systematic notation. We'll say the class there on the right, we'll call that the bare module cost is equal to the FOB cost multiplied by this bare module factor. So that's the value we were looking up from the table. And this is a number that's typically around 3 to 4. And when we do, the, when we do this calculation, it's always at a certain point in time. Typically, when the data set is available to us for this value. So these values are what we look up in our databases. And they're, for example, in Dr. Woods' book for 1970. Now, sometimes the first criticism people have is they say, well, that's out of date. Why would we use stuff from 40 years ago? Well, it's not out of date because Don Woods wrote last published book in 93 and made revisions to it subsequently. So what, what is done is you get the data at any point in time, and you deflate the data down to a single point, 1970. So those data are not out of date. They're not 1970s costs. They're costs from whenever the data was retrieved by Dr. Woods over many years, and then he's deflated them. So we, we saw how we inflate. He deflates and takes it back to a single point in time 1970, and record that in, in his tables. Okay. What we're going to do is take that data then from 1970, multiplied by a bare module factor, to get the bare module costs. And the majority of today's class, is, or the, at the end of today's class, I'd say, is to look at what is the situation when this unit now has the requirement that it needs to be operating at higher temperatures, higher pressures, and made from different materials of construction, then we need to do a little bit more sophistication um, in estimating the costs when it's installed. Because as you can imagine, a unit that's made from stainless steel, you don't join it up to piping that's made from carbon steel. Your piping that you use in this bare module now also needs to be operated. If your unit over here is made to operate at very high temperatures, you need to use piping that's capable of withstanding those same high temperatures. Okay, so the costs inside the bare module will also go up if the cost of the unit itself uh, needs to be inflated for temperatures, pressures, and materials of construction. Okay, then our bare module costs correspondingly also uh, grow, get inflated. So we'll see how to do that um, in a minute. Okay. So, so the mechanism for doing this is by using a series, an equation where we have our looked up cost from the database, we inflate for capacity, we inflate for the fact that time, um, sorry, that, that equipment and technology costs more in future years. There's this cost for getting it installed, and then there's this additional cost for making it uh, capable of, of estimating the capability at higher temperatures, pressures, and materials of construction. What you'll notice is that these are it's a multiplicative equation. So intuitively, and you would expect it, you can do these in any order and multiply them all up and you'll get the correct answer, which is correct for multiplication. However, the approach and the eight point steps I outlined for you should be followed because you will then always do it in the right order and you'll have the correct way of thinking about it. You can, in all fairness, go and look at the database cost, then inflate for time, and then go and inflate the capacity. But you'll start to see, especially when it comes to the operating conditions, the, the eight-point step I've given you in the, in the assignment yesterday, as well as now in the course notes, um, will lead you down a path that will make you get, this, get the correct answer at the end. Okay? So there can be a little bit of confusion, especially around that last part. So don't just multiply out. But what I do want to emphasize is that it is, it's multiplicative and not additive, as you might expect. OK, so then let's, let's uh, just recap quick the capacity factor. This is one of the first steps in that eight-step procedure where we inflate or deflate the cost. There's no, no um, there's not an issue going up. We're looking for cost A. Okay, and we're given cost B. So B is always our known case, 
and we want the cost of A. And, and B may be higher or lower depending on the ratio of the existing unit versus the unit we desire. And that factor is anything about the equipment that correlates well with cost. So yesterday's tutorial, you started to see a few examples. Heat exchanger is its area. The area of the heat exchanger is the feature or the factor of that unit that correlates best with cost. In certain vessels, it's the volume that the vessel can hold that correlates with cost. But not always. Sometimes it's the, like you saw in the one example of the flash vessel, it's the length multiplied by the diameter raised to 1.5. So it kind of seems awkward that, that that factor has been chosen, but that's the factor that best correlates with cost. Okay, so we will go to the tables and find that factor. We don't have to guess what that factor might be. The researchers in this area, Dr. Woods and others that have written textbooks on this topic, have figured out what factor is the one feature of the equipment that best correlates with cost. They've reported that in the table, and that's the one we're going to use. And the reason why they do that is because that factor will correlate in a logarithmic fashion, and they then also report for you what that exponent n is. And I showed you a little bit last class. Um, this is an actual example from, from Dr. Woods's uh, source material where he's correlated cost here on the vertical axis on a log scale, and then here on the horizontal axis, um, let's just take a look at that. He's, this is for a distillation column. The feature that best correlates with the cost is the column's diameter measured in inches multiplied by the distance between the plates, so the plate height in feet. So awkward units, it's a multiplication of two lengths. That, that product is the feature of the distillation column that best correlates with cost here on the vertical axis on a log scale. So given that, then the slope is is going to be a linear line, uh, will be the that exponent to n. Now I will also add that you started to notice in the tables yesterday that sometimes you're given one range and then a second range next to it. If you notice in those cases, what happens is that the first range has one exponent for n, say for example 0.6, the second range will have a different exponent for n, maybe 0.73, which indicates that there's a region where that linear relationship on the log axis doesn't hold it. So essentially what, what that table is doing, if you had to uh, plot it out, is it says that there's a region where the data correlate linearly with one slope, and then there's a region <coughs> with a different slope. So the first row in the table is for this range, and the second row is for that range, and this one will have one exponent n, and then that second part of the range will have a different exponent n. So you, you will see that, that sometimes in those, those tables. So we come back to the cost. Well, let's, let's cover the cost estimation. So once we've adjusted for capacity, and then we'll adjust for temperature, materials, and pressure, uh, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. The, one of the final steps that you perform in those correlations are to inflate for, for the fact that we're bringing it to the cost of today's dollars. So what we'll see then is we use one of several indexes to do that. So once we've estimated the cost in 1970, we now bring it up to a point in time where we're interested in, in the results. So typically uh, 20, 2013 or 2012. Four indexes we can choose from, two of which are most useful to us, the Marshall and Swift Index and the Kemenge Plant Cost Index. Marshall and Swift, unfortunately, from last year went private. So to get their indexes now, you have to pay a lot of money, and we don't have that number. So that's why the indexes end at 2011. It's the last year we have publicly available. So that's the first problem with Marshall and Swift. Um, so we, we will likely start to transition to ChemEng Climate Cost Index. As you notice in the tutorial, and it's true for many pieces of equipment, they give similar, similar values. And so it doesn't really matter which index of the two we use. 
The other problem with all these indexes, and uh, some people who were asking this in the class yesterday, can we get the index for 2013? Some people were asking why, why 2012, 2011? Maybe the second quarter of 2013. Maybe the second quarter of 2013. So typically what's done is these indexes are calculated um, on a quarterly basis, or in the case of CPCI, it's calculated on a monthly basis. So we can get as, as recent as last month's index. These values that are reported here on the table and as well as on the course website are the average of the index over the year. So we have to wait for 2013 to finish before we get that 2013 index, and then there's usually a few uh, weeks delay before we can get that as well. But um, the principle is that every quarter or every month, depending on the index, that value is compiled and is made, made available in the database, which companies subscribe to. Uh, CEPCI, you will see this one likely in your future career because it's, it's a more readily available index. Um, it's actually it, quoted in documents. So when companies are building a new plant, they will include that index to inflate the costs for with their vendors. So it's a well-established index that's used in the industry. Um, very common. What makes up that index? What were some of the features that you saw and uh, looked up in yesterday's tutorial that included in that? There's, there's a moving cost section, there's building and labor costs. Equipment costs, building and labor costs. Engineering supervision. Someone from the back over there? Installation. Installation. Okay, so the purpose of this index is that it's a composite number that will give you an indication of how equipment pricing and everything related to the equipment has changed over the years. It's not just a static um, number that's, say, for example, correlated with the cost consumer price index. Okay, so it's very specific to the chemical process industry, and it's a general index. It's made up of several components. I, if you read the article on the course website, um, there's multiple, multiple features that go into making up that index, and those are evaluated every month and that index is published. <coughs> Does that index include time value of money? So by using this index, are we accounting for time value of money? basis, people sit down and compile the data for now. So they did the same thing multiple times going back over all these years. Those were the costs associated with building plants and installing equipment and all those sub-components that make up the index at the time the index was compiled. So those using this, this factor over here to inflate to today's dollars will bring and will automatically embed for you the time value of money. There's no need to take an additional TBM calculation on top of this or after, after this calculation. By, by using this index and the multiple of the, high, the year, say, 2000's year divided by 1970, if you're bringing a 1970 price up to 2000, by multiplying by 394 divided by 123, you're going to account for time value of money and, and the value of those cash flows in the, in the different years. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's for free. Okay? Don't go deflate and inflate again for time value of money after that. That's a key point. Okay, so that was actually the intention then of the one question eight. So question eight asks you to find an equivalent time value of money um, percentage I. 
So you recall from the uh, TVM session, there's a single percentage I. When we're doing time value of money calculations, find what that percentage I is that will match the trend of the Marshall and Swift index or the CEPCI index. So that's, how, how might that be useful? Like why am I asking questions to solve questionnaires? Someone else, in the back. I'm gonna pick on someone if there's no hands. Why would it be useful to have a time value of money index I instead of using Marshall <coughs> Swift or CEPCI? Using I is assuming a, a constant relationship between how the time value of money increases year over year. Whereas it fluctuates. So, so the TVM is going to be a constant, whereas we know our indexes fluctuate. So, so that, that's, that's correct. But why, would, why might we want to know what the equivalent time value of money index is that matches that uh, Marshall and Swift or CEPCI index? Why would that be useful to know? Only for right, so it's useful in the case where if you're estimating a year or two ahead or in the instance where your company doesn't have the Marshall Swift Index available to you or you're in a situation where you don't have an, the internet connection around to look up what CEPCI or Marshall Swift is. But if you know a rule, a rough value of say 3 or 4 or 5 percent, whatever it is, you can inflate and deflate. It's also good to know what that is because that gives you a baseline from where your company can then start to judge what minimal acceptable rates of return are. You want to know how much you're going to be spending on equipment and cash flows in future years. Um, would you inflate, would you use the Marshall and Swift to take advantage of the current year and then use the TDM from the current year to the future year or is it just the TDM all across? Yeah, uh, the intention of that question is, let's say you don't have Martian Swift available to you, then, but you do have the cost in a, in a prior year. It doesn't have to be 1970. You're just talking with someone and they say, you know what, it cost, this pump cost us $20,000 in 1995. And you're curious what it might cost you in today's dollars. So you can then use that I value and quickly compute it. A rough estimate. I mean, that's all. We're not pretending ever in any of these uh, <coughs> these material we're covering here, we're going to get accurate estimates that are very, very close to what we'll find in pay. We will recognize as large windows of error. Okay. okay, so those having that ballpark knowledge is good is good for understanding just the industry that you work in. So what you'll what you'll actually find is that your inflation rate is higher than the consumer price index. So it's costing us more and more at a faster rate to build these plants than what the average inflation is around us. Okay, so let's get uh, back to some of these correlations. I'd like us to solve this problem. We did this uh, very briefly in class. Let's uh, solve this problem, but now follow the eight-step systematic process we used in the tutorial on, on Monday. <coughs> so we're estimating the cost in 2000 for this heat exchanger. shouldn't take you more than three minutes to do. So the area is 70 meters squared. It's operating at a pressure of 1 MPA. Floating head problems. So it's the base, basic heat. was look up the correlation and we use this page from Don, Dr. Woods' book it matches our description it's a floating head heat exchanger made from these materials carbon steel 
So it, it might seem trivial to step in, and a few people are asking, do I always have to follow the eight steps? Well, no, you don't. If you're comfortable with this process, after a while, you'll, it will become automatic. But initially, let's follow these eight steps so that we're certainly recovering everything. So look up the correlation, so we say words, page 5.5. Five. The next step is the range of clickable. And so we must make sure that the correlation we're about to use is, is relevant to us. We're dealing with the situation with the area 70 meters squared. The base unit over here has a size of 100 meters squared. So it's 10 to the 2 meters squared. So that's what the, our base unit is. So the range is always a dimensionless number, 0.02 to 20. That's a dimensionless number. How do we verify that is we take our unit, so 70 meters squared, divided by 100 meters squared. So the units will always cancel out. And this is between 20 and 0 0.02. So is our range applicable? Yes. So a value of 0.7 lies in between those lower and upper bounds. We can absolutely go ahead and use that, that correlation. Step three is to look up the base capacity in the base year. Sorry, the base cost, let's say, in the base year. So what we'll say is um, FOB in 1970 for this unit is equal to, remember uh, we said, what do we call the known unit is a. Okay, B is, B is always our known unit and A is the new design. So for the known unit in 1970, we paid 8,000 for it. Okay, so we paid 8 to the 10 to the 3, $8,000. In 1970 for the unit. Oh, um, in the size scale, do you have one word that says was uh, point one? Would that affect your denominator? Yeah, well, uh, it doesn't affect it over here, but I'll show you in the next example, in another example. So in 1970, that unit cost $8,000. So that was step three. Step four is now to inflate for the capacity. So our unit is 70 meters squared. The base unit was 100, so we expect to pay less for less area. In 1970, we would pay FOB in 1970 for our unit is equal to a multiple of 8,000. So it's 70 over 100 raised to the 0 0.71 for the exchanges. So that's what's um, given over there in the, in the next slide. So 70 over 100, 2.71 is 62. Okay, so I'd like you to use this notation going forward, which is why I'm going through the eight step process. So our, our cost on a pallet at someone's docks in 1970 would have been $6,210 for that. The next step five is to correct for pressure and temperature. So there's no, no requirement to do that in this case because the unit is at normal conditions. So step five is and is not applicable. The next step six. We would now like to get the bare module cost for this unit. So we say the bare module cost in 1970 for our unit A is equal to the FOB cost in 1970 multiplied by the bare module factor. So the bare module factor for heat exchanges of this type is 3.14. So that's equal to 6 
cost of this unit in 1970, all installed, painted, instrumented, foundations laid, piping and so forth, all around it, is 19,500. So that, we're paying three times the amount than the quoted cost from the supplier. So a supplier in 1970 would have given us a quote for 6,200. Once we're going, once that unit's all installed and everything, we're now paying 19,500. Question, does that 19500 include the original cost of the unit? The 6210, that's $6,000. Or is it the additional cost for installation, piping, supervision, safety, and so on? So, installation, etc., is equal to the difference. Okay, so it's somewhere in the order of 13,000. 13, so you're paying an additional 13 for getting it all installed. So it's 13,290. Okay, we need to be able to break this apart because these two monies are going to flow to different people. 6,000 is going to go to your vendor, 13,000 is going to be used internally in your company to, to get this uh, installed and so forth. So a total cost of 19,500. Step seven is, let's bring this to today's dollars now. So this was back in 1970, we'd like this for 2,000 was the, the question asked. So the final step, well, one of the final steps is to say the bare module cost in 2000 for this unit is equal to the ratio of the inflation factors multiplied by the price in 1970. So that's 19,500 multiplied by 1089 divided by 301. And that gets us to 10, 13 years ago, it would cost 70,000. Okay, so we've gone from 20,000 odd dollars to about 70,000 dollars. And that takes into account the time. Over these, over these uh, 30 years, from 1970 to 2000, this is the additional cost. Well, that's the actual cash you would have paid in 2000. Back in 1970, the actual cash you would have paid is around 20,000. Okay, so that's where the time value of money factor comes in. The final step eight is to report the plus or minus 40% errors. So we won't calculate that over here, but you would add 40% on and take 40% off and report the range. Okay, so that's 70, okay. okay, so sometimes there's no error, sometimes there's also no bare module factor. In those situations, uh, what's a, what, how can we proceed? Look at some of the similar equipment and use, their, use that value. So for the bare module cost, so if FPM is not given to you, so this quantity over here, sometimes you'll see that this is not in the table. Okay, when that's not in the table, you can use it, the price, that uh, factor from another unit that's of similar shape and size and type. And that makes it sense because, for example, you'll notice some of the heat exchangers further down in the table here um, from this particular one, they don't have their bare module costs reported. But if you look at these heat exchangers, the geometry of them is pretty similar. Same number of ports, similar type of instrumentation and piping that has to be hooked up to them. So it makes total sense then that in this next row over here, we're, we're asked to, if we had to say use um, the value from this row, there's no bare module cost that we can use this value over here and justify it on that basis. Similar reason for errors. 
Okay, the error in estimating uh, some of these uh, can be copied down. Two rules of thumb for Dr. Woods' book, uh, sorry, one rule of thumb for Dr. Woods' book, if error is not given, um, in general you can assume plus or minus 40%, that's the, that's the default value. Another rule of thumb, not just for Don Woods' book, but for any capital cost equipment, is a multiplier of three for the bare module cost, if not given at all. If you cannot find a similar value, first try to find a similar value, but if you cannot find a similar value, a value of three is a reasonable, a reasonable estimate. What's the point of the bare module cost? Bare module factor. Okay, so in general, things cost three times to get it installed. So when we say three times, it means the three factor of three refers to the cost is going to triple. But remember, that triple cost already includes the base profit cost. Okay, so to double the cost of the original equipment is going to go for installation and so forth. And then one times the cost is going to go for the actual equipment itself. So let's take a look at that next in this uh, next example. We'll, we'll skip um, we'll skip the re this reflux example is over here for you in the notes. I won't go through it. It's fully worked out, so you can uh, use that as an example uh, to try out this process a second time if you need a bit more practice. So let's just come back to this heat exchanger um, example and emphasize that point. When we calculated the bare module cost in 1970 of 19,500, 6,200 is due to the equipment, 13,200 is due to installation. Okay, so that bare module factor, which is 3.14, one times is for the FOB cost, the 2.14 is due to those other installation costs uncrating, unpacking, supervision, safety, all those other costs that go, go in there. So that's why the total factor is 3.14. Mm -hmm. Another way of looking at it is 3.14 minus 1 gets you 2.14. That 2.14 gets you the installation cost. Why am I emphasizing this? Consider the case now of a heat exchanger that's made from different materials and is capable of withstanding high temperature and high pressure. What's the installation cost going to be for that? The same, okay. So now this is where the complexity comes in. Let's pay attention. When we're dealing with high temperature, high pressure, and different materials, we cannot just go multiply by that temperature factor or the pressure factor that you saw there in the tables. Because that multiplier isn't applicable to the entire cost. The installation of the unit is not going to go up because you're installing high uh, carbon steel versus stainless steel. It's going to cost just as much to install one over the other. Uh, the installation includes the cost of like the piping and stuff around the with that be upgraded. Okay, that's absolutely right. Except for the piping. Okay. The piping is the only one that will change. So when we say that this installation cost, that's the bare module cost of everything, including piping, instrumentation, safety. It's true that the installation costs don't change. There's only one installation cost that does change, however, in proportion to the type of equipment and its capacity for handling temperature and pressure, and that's the piping cost. So we're going to break out the piping cost and inflate that separately but keep the installation costs as, as was. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This 2.14 that's over here, this is the cost of taking the, uh, of estimating the shipping and, and installation, electrical, concrete instruments, all of these. We can actually break that cost down even further. And this is where all the work goes in Dr. Woods' book and all these other textbooks that do this. This 2.14 number doesn't just appear somewhere. It, it's actually computed through fairly intensive investigation and made up of the sum of several other components. So the factor 1 refers to my equipment. A factor of 0.46 refers to the piping. A factor of 0.05 goes to concrete, steel, instrumentation, and so forth. And then those get added up, and you'll land up with a number of 
uh, 3.14, one unit of which goes to the original equipment and then the rest for installation. So what we're going to do is we're going to break out the piping cost and, and scale that. Circuit. So let's see how that's done here in this next, next, next example. Here's a heat exchanger. Its cost, sorry, its <coughs> pressure factor is 1.25 and its materials factor, because we're going to make it from stainless steel instead of carbon steel, is a factor of three. So where do we get to use these? Where do we look them up first? So here is the pressure factor. We want to use this heat exchanger at 3 MPa instead of 1 MPa. So that higher pressure, we come down here and we see at around 5 MPa, we need to use a multiplier of 1.52. If we're going to make this, the, the shell and the tubes from stainless steel, we need to use a multiplier of 3. If we were only going to make the tubes from, say, brass, but keep the shell as carbon steel, we'd use a multiplier of 1. So read out the factor relevant to the exchange we're estimating. And then we're going to make the entire unit from, from stainless steel, so our multiplier is 3. So let's get to see uh, where, where that's used now. So step if we're estimating this for this heat exchanger with a, a multiplier of uh, 1.5 for pressure and 3 for the stainless steel, step 1, 2, 3, and 4 over here stay the same. Those don't change. Where it starts to change is at step 5. So let's take a look then at what that step 5 looks like. note of those multipliers. Yeah. Um, in the notes it says the first target one point two five because we're going to three. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay, one point two five. Yeah, it's meaning this like okay so let's uh, let's go with this guy, one point five two because those are my numbers here. As, as I had it before, the installation cost is equal to, so this is the installation cost, is equal to the 19,500 that we had there. So this take the bare module cost, 19,500, okay, and subtract out the original cost of the equipment. That's equal to 13,290. So the way, if you, if you want to write that symbolically, is let's take that 19,500. That's the original cost that you look up. Okay, so recall the 19,500 from the prior step was equal to 6,210 multiplied by 3.14. That's how we got that 19,500. So C0, that original cost, multiplied by the bare module factor minus out the original cost. Okay, so that's why we'll see this in the notes. Take the bare module factor minus one multiplied by the original cost and that will get you the cost of installation. <coughs> take out and find what is it going to cost to upgrade that equipment. So the, our supplier needs to make that equipment capable of withstanding high temperature and pressure. So they're going to cost us more for that. It's like, kind of like you're walking in and you're buying a car. You buy the base car, but then you buy all sorts of upgrades. Like you want the nice music system and the GPS and so forth built in. These are upgrades. So same thing here. Here's the base heat exchanger. If you want to upgrade it for high pressure, and made from different materials, there's an incremental charge for that. So let's take the upgrade charge. 
that's equal to the base price of 6,210 multiplied by 1.52 for pressure multiplied by 3.0 for materials of construction minus the 6,210 which is the base cost. So we're looking at the upgrade incremental cost. What is just the upgrade going to cost you? And in that case, that works out to 22,000. It's going to cost you an additional 22,110 to upgrade the units. Symbolically, that's equal to the original cost, 6,210, multiplied by the pressure factor, multiplied by the material factor, minus the, that cost, C0. So numerically and then symbolically. So we'll sometimes just use the C0, FP, FM, minus 1. This is our incremental cost to upgrade the unit. So we've got the base cost of the unit, then we've got the cost to install it, then we've got the cost to upgrade the unit itself to be capable of hand handling high pressures and temperatures. Now we also need to upgrade our bare module costs. So once we bring this unit into our plant, that unit has to be hooked up to piping and instrumentation that's capable of uh, withstanding high temperatures, pressures, and also made from similar materials of construction as the original unit itself. <coughs> but we say that only the piping needs to be upgraded. So, so what we'll do then is, that's 22,110. That's the incremental charge the vendor is spending on their side to make the equipment capable of working at high temperature pressure and different materials. We're going to take that and multiply it by just the piping factor. And that's going to tell us how much we're going to spend on our side to upgrade the piping. So that comes, it follows this, this formula. We're going to take 22,110, multiply it by what we call F piping, and then also multiply by a factor psi. Factor psi says, let's visualize this back at that bare module. We're going to have to upgrade the piping and the instrumentation and so forth. Here's our heat exchanger in that bare module. The piping and stuff going to it and from it needs to be upgraded and changed, but not 100% of the piping in the bare module. Only some fraction of the piping will need to be changed. Some cases that could be as high as 80%, 90%. Some cases it's, it's fairly small. So psi then is a number that ranges between 1 and 0.7. And that's different for different companies. So if, you don't, if you don't know a value, you can pick middle of the road one. Uh, in this case, we're going to pick 0.7. We're replacing 70% of the piping inside the bare module. Not all of the piping needs to be adjusted. Some of it's just standard utility hookups, and so that doesn't need to change. <coughs> so this incremental piping cost then is 22,110 multiplied by the piping factor, which is 0.46. So our supplier is spending 22,100 to upgrade the units on their side. We, our factor is 0.46 of that on our side, multiplied by we're only going to replace 70% of the piping. So that gets me a cost on my end of 7,120. And then we finish off this, uh, this total capital cost estimate by just adding these, these four amounts. So let's uh, quickly show that over here. The total cost then. The total cost in 1970 is the equipment. Which is 6,210. The 
vendor needs to upgrade the equipment, they're going to charge us 22110 for that. We're going to install it on our side, so we calculated that earlier, that was 13290 And then our piping upgrades, that's going to be 7120 so the total bill in 1970 for this unit is 48730 So we've gone up quite substantially. We started off with a cost of 6200 but once we upgrade for higher temperature and pressure, our installation, our piping, we then end up with a number that's closer to 50000 This is back in 1970. And then the final step is to upgrade to future dollars. Okay, so a few confused faces still. What I'll do next class is we'll have another example on this. But please go work through this and at least try to recalculate these four numbers separately.